you will just introduce yourself, Phil, and tell us how that came about, that initial book, and your interest in bringing decision science into marketing. Yeah, thanks, Louise. So prior to that, I'd spent 25 years in client-side marketing. So I grew up in Unilever, spent over 16 years there. Then I moved to Diageo and then to T-Mobile. And I thought probably quite arrogantly that I knew everything there was to know about communications, why people bought brands, how to promote a brand, etc. But I, I came came up against a problem, which is that I had commissioned a huge piece of quantitative research when I was VP for T-Mobile in the head office, Deutsche Telekom's head office in Germany. And the, the research was across 12 European countries. And yeah. the results were just not were just ambiguous. They just did not make sense. And I didn't know what to do. It was quite a difficult moment for me because I had invested a lot of money, company money in this, and also personal equity. And someone introduced me to the guys who founded Decode Marketing, the co company I now work with. Um, and one of them is a neuroscientist and the other is a cognitive psychologist. And they completely blew my mind with their perspective on marketing and communications and they had come at this of course from academia and science and they helped me understand how and why ads were working or not they helped me unpick some of the research and they were using frameworks and language that I'd never ever encountered before and when when I would look at them and say how come you guys know all this stuff they would look at me completely bemused to say but how come you don't know this stuff because we're using frameworks or referencing studies that have been around for decades in some cases in the fields of decision or behavioral science. And by that, I mean a whole breadth from neuroscience through cognitive and social and evolutionary psychology, and then more recently, behavioral economics. And that was, that was a real revelation to me. Not only how, did this parallel world exist that I'd never never tapped into, never just been completely unaware of. But also the fact that this parallel world had been studying human behavior for years and years and years, and in my experience, knew more about human behavior and behavior change than I certainly knew and that anyone in the commercial world knew. Um, and, and it was a real revelation because marketing is fundamentally about behavior change right we want people to respond to an ad to buy our brand to share stuff online to talk about our stuff to buy more to switch whatever it might be it's all about human behavior and long story short i put these guys to work on the relaunch of the t-mobile brand around europe and their approach was had a huge commercial impact so the first part of the relaunch was in the uk and we, uh, based on the principles that Decode introduced, we created an ad that grew sales by 49%. And to date has something like 41 million YouTube views. And uh, the more, and, and then we replicated the principles across other brand touch points, a similar effect. You know, we had the sales department ringing up saying, why didn't you tell us about all this activation activity? And, and the fact was there wasn't any activation activity. It was people responding to the advertising. And the more I worked with these guys, the more I, I realized this was so fundamental to marketing and I wanted to be part of it. So I quit and I joined them and I set the company up in the UK. It was founded in Germany. And then a couple of years later, I thought, this is so fundamental and it's so important. And I'm so convinced by behavioral or decision science that I want to bring it to a wider audience. So that's that was the genesis of the book. And I thought if I can if I can capture these key principles in terms that I understand, because I'm not a neuroscientist and I never will be, but if I can understand enough about the key principles, translate them into everyday examples, a language that can help other marketeers and their agencies. So yeah, so that was the origin of the book. I I then revised and updated it back end of 2022 with with new content and yeah i think it's it it's become behavioral science has become more accepted over that time but it's certainly still not mainstream i don't think it's it features in pe necessarily in every marketer's education it should 
you know, if I had my time again, I would probably go back to university and study psychology or something, mm. because it, as I said, it's all about behaviour change. So yeah, still, still, it's still obviously a very active and burgeoning world in academia. There are many more courses now available for people to take, but at uh, undergraduate and masters, and of course, further levels to do with decision making and communication. So yeah, it's becoming more accepted, but but still there's a way to go. And in the sort of in the library of what we put forward as recommended reading in behavioural science, your book for me was such an eye opener. You go through the academic journey, the thinking fast and slow, which is hugely inaccessible. But there's the nudge. Cialdini's book, absolutely fantastic, been updated, persuasion, so influence now persuasion, but. As you were saying, and you still work very strongly in academic fields, they were very much academic psychology experiments. Whereas moving over to open your book and be actually talking about advertising, real life cases, marketing, seeing advertisements, seeing examples of such simple concepts like just moving the numbers further apart to make... Mm. The price appear much wider apart. Simple things like that was really such an eye-opener for myself. I mean, since then, Jez Groom's Ripple, I think, is sort of along the same lines, Rory Sutherland's Alchemy. But there's still really a dearth of practical yeah. books yeah. Ask, showing us how we can take these examples forward and try them for ourselves. Yeah, what what I was particularly delighted about was after Decoder was published and I did some work with Carlsberg, the beer company, and their insight manager in Denmark, which is where they are headquartered, loved the book. And she took some of the ideas back to her her business and said, listen, we should implement these. And she was met with a lot of resistance. They said, yeah, academic stuff, you know, it's doesn't it doesn't work in the real world. So bless her she set out to test the things concepts and the principles herself and she kindly shared the results with me and some of them are published in the updated version of decoded so she was able to say right this is the theory and what what phil published here's the test that we did and here are the real world results and she found without fail that they replicated so she's got some really robust evidence then to say here's some really neat stuff that we should we should do and often it's it's kind of trivial little things that you could change you know if you're going to be printing in their case a menu anyway then why not print two versions with a minor change between them and see what the effect is so i think that's that's the real joy of it when you can take the principle and then test it and apply it yourself Absolutely. So I'll just say welcome again to everybody who has joined us. I hope you're enjoying our conversation here. And do please feel free to put any of your questions in the chat box and I'll give you the opportunity later on to come and put them to um, our speaker today yourself, to Phil. We're going to be talking in a little while about value for money, what that means, and then we're going to move on and we're going to hear some very exciting news about how AI tools are being used, I feel in particular, in, in their company. So we've talked very much about your sort of background for everybody who wasn't so familiar with you, Phil. Let's move on now to some work you're doing at the moment that I found really interesting when you told me about it. And it's all around the understanding, the meaning of the term value for money which as I said to you I got immediately excited about because I'm so often aware of subjects that aren't generally accessible and yet we all know that we walk into the supermarket pick something up and say to ourselves well that's good value for money but yet as we were chatting between ourselves it has such wide-reaching implications both for luxury vengan goods as it were and just down to a loaf of bread. So maybe you tell us a little bit more about the work you're doing and the understanding of this term value for money. Yeah, sure. Let me let me just share some some slides. So th this came up was in the in the last sort of 18 months because of the so-called cost of living crisis and the fact that prices were rising and people didn't have this, their incomes were not rising. 
forces behavior change. And when you look at the main motivators or claimed motivators of, of purchase, whether it's during a cost of living crisis or indeed a couple of years prior to that during COVID time, value for money is the most often cited, right? I want value for money. and But people do, you know, they mention other things like product or service quality, reliability, price is mentioned. And of course, that's a factor in, in value for money. But value for money has two components. It has money, of course, and it has this thing, this concept of value. And it doesn't always mean cheap because the same person could mm-hmm. spend over 5,000 euros a, on a Louis Vuitton handbag and mm-hmm. think that's great value mm-hmm. for money. And then they could spend one euro on a gelato and think that's good value for money as well. Or maybe that's poor value for money, depending. So it's not only about money. We need to really understand how the brain determines value and how what determines what people are willing to pay. Because ultimately, you know, we could we could reduce all of our prices and sell more, but that's not what brands are are about. Brands are about some sort of intangible equity and quality that makes people willing to pay for for them. So if we go back to neuroscience and look at what determines a purchase decision, I think that we can learn a lot. There's a really interesting experiment which was carried out at Stanford University by Professor Brian Knutson and his colleagues. And he put people into fMRI brain scanners and he did three things. He showed them an image while they were in the scanner, an image of a, of a product. And one Godiva chocolates was one of those products in the study. For four, So they saw this for four seconds. Then he showed them the price for four seconds. And then he asked them to press a button to indicate whether or not they would buy the brand for that price. And all Knutson wanted to do was observe what happens in the brain at those different points in time. And what he found was very interesting because when people see a brand, their so-called reward system is activated. Now, this is part of the, the orbitofrontal cortex. And the scientists knew from prior studies three very significant things. One, that the same part of the brain is activated when we see something that is pleasurable or rewarding to us. So if you show a mum a photo of her kids, her reward system is activated. Or if you show art lovers images of artworks, their reward centers are activated. So that was one thing. This is brands are inherently rewarding or pleasurable to us. The second finding from prior studies was that when this part of the brain is activated, there's a very high probability that action will then follow which is plausible, right? Because if we see something that we want that's rewarding and pleasurable, we want to get that thing because because it provides some sort of reward. Okay, when when people saw price, something very different happened in the brain. The insula, which is linked to, is activated when we experience pain, both physical pain as well as emotional pain. And also when we experience disgust, the insula is activated. And again, this is plausible because it's almost like the brain is saying, I want those Godiva chocolates, but it hurts because I have to give you money and giving up something away you know, is painful for, for the brain. And then what happened was a trade-off between the two activations. And if the reward activation was sufficient to overcome the pain activation, the person would then press the yes button. Yes, I will buy. And if they didn't, press, if they pressed no, then pain was was more significant. And this is what we call, an, it's the, the neural correlates of purchase. So basically what goes on in the brain when we make a purchase decision. And because the brain does this before we actually make the decision, this is about expectation. So it's about expected reward and and expected pain. So when it comes to cost of living crisis, what are some of the things that we can do? So if we look firstly at the pain side, are there ways that we can reduce the expected pain? Now, we know that that money is equated with pain, but it's also the behavioral cost involved 
in acquiring the reward. So the time that it takes, the cognitive effort that it takes, whether there are is any other sort of frustration or irritation along the path to purchase or even thereafter. So in the cost of living crisis, if I buy something and the packaging isn't suitable and I end up wasting it, then the brain learns from that experience and that will increase expected pain in the future. So it's all about not just money, but the, the behavioral cost involved in the purchase. Now, some companies address this cost of living directly by reducing the pain. So here's an example from Nomad Foods, Bird's Eye brand. Bird's Eye pays your bills, right? It's tough right now. So we give you a chance to win money to pay your bills. You can do that directly. But there are other ways that we can work with it. Because it's expected pain, we can shape that expectation by how we visualize price information. And this is an example from Decoded, where the daily special in a restaurant was was chalked up on a board and they showed the price three different ways. It's, it's the same price in each case, 10 euros. But the menu on the top right, which just has the number 10, sold more than the others because the euro symbol and the euro word trigger more pain than just the number 10 on its own. And the other, the example that you alluded to, Louise, before is about price reduction and how the brain assumes that numbers that are physically separated by a greater distance have a greater difference between them. Because when we learn to count, we count in the horizontal plane. And as the numbers get bigger, the physical distance separating them also grows. So people rate the discount at the bottom to be greater than the one at the top, even though, of course, it's not. And how you visualize price can be even more important than the price itself. This was a study that we did where we got people to rate prices according to their presentation. And consistently, people rate the prices at the top right to be more expensive than the ones at the bottom left. Why? Because they've got codes contained in them that we learn are associated with premium. So if it's the black and white, that's quite minimalist. If it's the red on the top right, that's embossed. It's got a starburst. It's got a silver background. All codes that we learn from premium products. Whereas the bottom left is discount land. It's promotion land. It uses promotional colors. It uses very basic pricing that we've learned from, from discounters. Even things like how we show a price reduction, you know, the, the same reduction left and right, eight euros down to 5.99, but the one on the right has significantly higher purchase intent simply because of the way the brain processes numbers, which is based on something called size congruency. Is Does the size of the number, the font, the physical representation of the font, is that congruent with? Does it fit? Does it match with the magnitude of the number? And if it does, it's processed more easily by the brain. And the fact that it's processed more easily leads to preference. And eight, the example on the right hand side is congruent because eight's bigger than 599. It's also written in bigger font. So there's, this is the, the other example. This was from Carlsberg I mentioned before. Coming back to the the menu, the Hungarian goulash, that was the example in Decoded. And then the insight manager at Carlsberg said, let's test it. So they produced some menus. And on some of them, they had the Danish currency symbol, Krona, KR. And on others, they didn't. And you can see what happened to purchase. They got a revenue increase of 11% just by making that small change. Now, a lot of people would kill for an 11% revenue increase, right? And you're not doing anything else. You're not doing anything out of the ordinary. You are going to print your menu cards anyway. So this stuff does does work in, in practice. So that's some, just some examples for the cost of living from, uh, from the pain side. When we look at the reward side of the equation, there's a lot more to go into. And if you read Decoded, there's a whole chapter on this about goals, which is the fact that we buy brands and products because they are instrumental in helping us achieve goals and achieving goals is rewarding for the brain and that's how it fits back with the reward system and goals are a mixture of functional goals so what the category or the product helps me helps me do you know whether it's broadband speed or clean laundry or transportation or something that tastes good 
but they're also more social, emotional and psychological as well. And if people are interested in learning more, please reach out to me. I'd be very happy to talk to you about about that in great greater detail. But I don't think we've unfortunately got time to do that today. That was really fascinating. Phil, and call it what you will, call it behavioural science, the psychology of marketing, decision science. Those slides that you've shown us are concrete examples of how this really works in real life, which is, as I say, was for myself sort of that groundbreaking tip over point where we moved off from nudge, thinking fast and slow, random hundred men in university <laughs> ask this question to as you say your very concrete examples of these practices working in real life and as I said since then I've read similar stories I mean particularly in Jez Groom's Ripple he uh, talks often about the menu example they're such simple mm. simple concepts aren't they Phil? Absolutely. And and often it is. I mean, Rory Sutherland had this lovely expression that he he's used right from his days when he was doing direct marketing before he got into this whole area. And it, the expression is dare to be trivial. And his example was just changing little things on a direct response coupon, direct marketing and measuring the effect. And what he found was it was often the seemingly trivial changes that actually actually drove a big impact. So I'm going to jump into the questions before we move on to our third subject today. There's a comment from Giles. He's not able to ask the question himself, but it's a great question. I don't know if you can actually... See that there, Phil, so I'm going to read for anybody who hasn't got their chat turned on. So, Giles Edwards, thanks very much for joining us today. He says, specifically, if I've understood it correctly, your stance that ultimately a brand exists to reduce cognitive effort when people make decisions. There's a few iterations of this point we use regularly when presenting the case for brand or future sales, as it's perhaps better articulated to business. Can you explain a bit more about the relationship between building trust, familiarity and reducing cognitive load as a rationale for brand building. There's a lot in there, but let's try and just tackle that quickly. Yeah, no, it's a great it's a great question. And I'm gonna I'm going to answer it with, with another slide if I can, because this this slide was one that, that shocked me when, when Decode first showed me. So this <clears throat> these are the no excuse me, fMRI scan images of the same person faced with different tasks. And the what happened before this experiment was people were asked to name their favorite brands in a number of different categories and other brands that were in their consideration set as well. So you know, their repertoire, perhaps, and other brands in the category that they would never consider buying. So that's what the scientists knew. First, we got this person's stated favorite, their repertoire, and brands they wouldn't consider buying. And what they did was put people into brain scanners and they had photographs or images of the, the brands and they drew a couple at random and showed them to the respondent and said, look at the images and choose a brand to buy. That was it. Look at the images, choose a brand to buy. And they just wanted to see what happened in the brain. And these are the responses of the same person's brain to different choices. So when... When I was Decode's client, they showed me this and they said, Phil, you've worked in marketing for quite a long time. How would the brain respond to its favorite brand? And I thought, well, they're trying to trick me here. And I said, it's obvious. You, you spend years building emotional engagement and resonance and, and affinity and whatever you want to call it. So if my brain saw its favorite, it's going to light up you know, like a Christmas tree lights. And the interesting thing is it doesn't. The brain on the left is thinking. It hasn't seen its favorite brand. Mm. So it is now considering a brand to buy. Whereas the brain on the right has seen its favorite and it has decided just like that in a, in a millisecond. And it is quite literally a, a no-brainer decision. So behind, you know, Back to Giles's question, brands become shortcuts to a decision. And why this is important has to do with our whole neurological evolution. And in fact, our continued existence as a species. 
because the brain on the left is burning up to 40%, 40% of the body's available energy. The brain on the right is using less than 5%. And if there's one thing, one mission the brain has, it's to keep us alive on the planet so we can pass on our DNA. That's it, basically, in evolutionary terms. And so the brain has evolved the most efficient operating systems it can to conserve energy because energy is not important for buying brands, right? Energy is important for survival, which is a little bit more more critical than, you know, which chocolate bar do I buy? And that's why these systems have evolved. And they've, they, yeah, they've become shorthanded to system one and system two. And this is quite a good example of that system one on the right being automaticity, right? It's intuitive, spontaneous, automatic, geared for action. Whereas system two on the left is more reflective and effortful. So that I think is is you know the hopefully the answer to to Giles's question. It's it's super important because if you can become the preferred brand, you've got all this millennia of neurological evolution on your side because then it will take quite a lot to upset that and to of course we do reconsider. Of course we can interrupt and disrupt and get people to try different things and maybe with experience over time we we switch preference but if not if the brand does a good enough job for us and help continues to help us meet our goals then we'll we'll work with the brain looking like the one on the right really fascinating and controlling controlling our excitement is you know that's the major that that that's the human task that overtake we overtake to stop ourselves being impulsive. I did a bit of research into dopamine. I have Parkinson's, coincidentally. And when you start taking medication for Parkinson's disease, which is a form of dopamine, there's racks of warnings about getting people to watch your behavior because as your body's becoming adjusted to the extra dopamine, there's very, very sad cases of people who've been involved in yeah, impulsive shopping, impulsive gambling, actually losing losing their homes <laughs> from yeah. impulsive gambling. So it's it's a really, really fascinating subject. And as you say, the core to all this argument all just comes down to our human behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to our second subject for the conversation today. Giles saying there, that's the slide I used. Hey. So there we are. Thumbs up to Giles using the appropriate material. Let's talk a little bit about something you were telling me about, about AI tools that have been built. You are using the behavioral science principle for creative optimization in advertising. It's, you know, it's the glittery toy at the moment. Everyone wants to talk about AI. We all want to quickly upskill, learn how to use AI. So let's hear how. AI is being used in your own particular company. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I was looking back over my, my sort of career at memorable moments and the the whole you know, revelation from behavioral science is certainly certainly one of them. The, this is another. And the reason the reason is as follows. One of the founders of our company, he is probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. He annoyingly did a double PhD, not content with one, at Caltech as well, California Institute of Technology, like, you know, the foremost academic institution worldwide. He did a double PhD, one PhD in neuroscience and the other in artificial intelligence. He co-wrote a book, Understanding Intelligence, which is still used in academia. So this guy has been waiting patiently for the computing power to enable his vision. And his vision is to have AI tools that are trained with human data and built around behavioral science principles. And now, thanks to you know the NVIDIA chips and, and the sort of leaps and bounds that have come on in, in machine learning, we're able to to do that. So I'd just like to to show people some of this because I, I think it's it's really, really exciting. It it starts with the fact that and this is from Nielsen, but if you talk to Kantar or econometric modeling companies, they all put the figure around the same same contribution, which is that the effectiveness of creative 
assets is the single biggest driver of sales and profit. So you can get your, your reach right, you can get your targeting right, but if you get your creative wrong, then you're leaving a lot of money on the table. So this Nielsen put it at 47%, Cantor say it's 50 Data to Decisions, a big econometric company, put it around 50 as well. So it doesn't matter. It, it's the single biggest driver. So what we thought was, how could we use AI and behavioral science to optimize that 50% to get it as good as it could be prior to going to market? Well, firstly, the question was, what's the barrier to doing that? And the barrier is often companies don't do it because it's hugely complex, particularly given the velocity of digital. Now, you know, the how many different creative treatments do we have? How many versions do we have for targeting? So we haven't got time to do it. We don't have the budget to do it. Often we don't have the knowledge to do it. And you also find you know, pockets of excellence in a business, particularly international businesses, but no real consistent way of, of doing this. So there's a, there's a lot of barriers that are very, very real. So we went back to first principles and said, what do we know from behavioral science are the drivers of creative effectiveness? And they are effective. They are, in essence, these six things. So firstly, you've got to get into the brain. Now, that kind of goes without saying, but I often say attention doesn't get the attention it deserves. People jump to things like emotions and forget the fact you've actually got to get into the brain to start with. Secondly, you've got to make sure that your creative is correctly attributed to your brand. Otherwise, you waste your money. If it's not linked to your brand, if it doesn't get encoded to memory, then game over. Thirdly, you want your creative to be processed as fluently, as easily as possible by the brain. So coming back to the the two brains there and burning energy, we don't want we don't want the brain to burn energy. We want this to be processed as, as easily as possible. Fourthly, you will probably have some sort of message, an intended message that's written in the brief that you want people to take out. You also want the message and the execution to be on brand and to support your brand values. Fifthly, we do want emotional response because we know from science that ads that evoke an emotional response get processed more deeply and have better memory encoding and recall and a higher chance of going being shared and going viral. And then lastly, you will probably have some sort of call to action, some something that, where you want to motivate and, and persuade. So we took those six drivers of creative effectiveness. And what we've done is build a, a digital consumer brain, which mirrors all of them. And we call this brain suite. It's an online, it's an online platform. Let me just give you an example for, for one of those one of the models within Brain Suite. So we have we have over a hundred different models that sit behind it, dealing with each of these component parts. So when we look at attention, for example, what we want to replicate is what the scientists call ground truth. And ground truth is where human beings look actually and in this case measured with eye tracking so measuring real behavior right you've got a, an image on the left then you've got the eye tracking data so you can see where people look when they look at that image so that's what we're trying to replicate so up until well it still exists today but we've there have been some systems around in fact we used to use this this ourselves until we had our own from from 3m the visual attention software which was based on a set of rules, you know, are people present, is there contrast, are edges present, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it gave you an approximation, but you can do better than approximating it these days. So this is our visual attention model. And if you compare it to the ground truth, you can see how accurate it is. And the reason why it's accurate is very simple. It's machine learning trained with human data. So we've got something like 15,000 hours of human eye tracking video that helps us predict attention to video. We've got eye tracking on something like four and a half million static images as well, which enables you to do this sort of thing. And you can do this in 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 a minute. It's just ridiculous. You know, you don't need you don't need a sample of humans if you've got something like this. 
but especially if you're iterating creative or if you've got I've got six different layouts where are people going to look you just chuck it in the machine and it'll give you the results in in a couple of minutes so brain suite as I said covers the six effectiveness drivers it works across any asset whether it's social media video or a bit of point of sale material email marketing any anything you want to throw at it it produces ready-made reports with metrics for each of the six effectiveness drivers. This is a real report for, for Budweiser. We can help as well by overlaying our expert understanding and telling you why you're getting the metrics you're getting and what to do about it if they're not not good enough. And this is a real example for a, a PepsiCo launch in France of a brand, an energy drink called Rockstar. Let's, let me just show you the results. So they gave us this uh, this out of home ad. They also used it for point of sale. We ran it through Brain Suite. It got an overall score of sixty eight. Oh, you you can see at the bottom we can do cut through in the environment as well. And then we made some recommendations, and based on those, they changed it. And this is this was the second image. So the score went up to a much much more impactful score. But the when you look at the detail, there's some really interesting stuff. So not only did cut through in, in the environment increase, <clears throat> but this is a new product launch, right? So attention on the product and attention on the brand name, which are critical, of course, they rose dramatically. And then in terms of the response, because this is trained, it's all trained with human data. So sentiment, which is one of the components of emotion, trained with human emotional response data, that went up by 20%. And we've also trained it with human responses to images and text so we can measure the associations that something conveys. So this was an energy drink. That's pretty important to convey. So energy associations went up by a third as well. Now, PepsiCo said, well, this is great. It sounds very interesting, but it's AI, right? We want, we want to test this with real humans. So they then put both of these visuals through their own shopper research panels and they found that the improved version had a purchase intent increase of five percentage points not five percent five percentage points and that was enough for them to say yeah this is this is good enough for us to use and they're now using it globally to test all of their pos materials you know they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year on pos and they'd never really tested any so this enables them now to do this very very high response sorry low response time i mean like they can go online and get the results get a full report in about three minutes and the cost because you can buy this on an ad hoc basis or a license basis a license basis enables all you can eat so the cost just tumbles and obviously the more you put through the machine the cheaper it becomes so this is this is really impactful we've we've had lots of clients obviously wanting to validate and you know why wouldn't you it's new it's a bit scary but we're always very open with how it works you know we would tell people like like the predicting visual attention example how it works and these are some of the results that clients have shared with us in terms of validating market impact so 83 percent correlation with sales uplift increasing video view throughs and stronger stronger branding and social media video those are all you know they're good good, good metrics but it doesn't stop there because the other benefit real benefit of ai as well is what it can do inside a company coming back to the reasons why we don't test all that creative because it's complex because it's time consuming because we don't have the capability and because we don't have the budget we we've had some amazing feedback from clients who are saying this has just enabled us you know we're getting we're making decisions 10 times faster we've saved 95 percent on our testing budget it's 80 percent less effort i mean just you know astonishing capability improvements and also sort of throughput and efficiency improvements so i think that's why you can see you can tell from the way i'm talking about it i'm hugely excited by this because i just think it's um, you know this is an element of ai people get wrapped up with generative ai and chat gpt and this is an, an area of ai that that may not get may not be hitting the headlines to the same extent but the machine learning side and when you you know, you can see what you can do with it. It's having tremendous impact. So, so, so interesting, Phil. I can see there people are 
putting in the chat there, finding everything that you're sharing with us. Very interesting, particularly interesting for me. I worked with 3M Vaz practically every day in market research yep. when we were giving feedback on new product design, on efficacy of websites. So to see it honed in there, the difference from the 3M Vaz, which I always thought was <laughs> amazing as it stood, but seeing the specification that's come out of that new model. And oh. also, I suppose... Thinking about, I mean, we don't all have the budgets to sign up for these tools, but thinking back to your earlier conversation that there are very easily cost-effective ways. You know, we've gone to the extremes, haven't we? It's like, this is the AI solution. It can be free to you using the tools. There are amazingly built tools. But also, back at the groundwork stage, it's sometimes, as you say, just doing an A-B test yeah. is hugely yeah hugely effective and results driven as in the examples of two different adverts or three different styles of menu tested at different exactly. times different days of the week things like that and that that's one of the real benefits we've we've found clients have said often the agency will come back with a few different layouts or you know and it's up to you 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 pick one and what happens debate right i like this well i like that well all that show the boss what does the boss think well i like this and it's just time consuming and it takes a lot of energy and in the end it's very subjective so who's right who's wrong and why so this just helps make it objective it takes the time and the effort out of the discussion and it gives you a valid answer as well that's the re really important bit so you know if you if you throw six different layouts at it you can very quickly get one dashboard back saying you know it's this one or whatever or you might want to then iterate so okay well if we tweak this or tweak that like like pepsico did with with rockstar what's the impact of that and because it's so fast you can you can turn stuff around you know i mean that that reports i showed you less than five minutes Right, you can do a visual salient thing in in a ninety seconds. It's just ridiculous. And in terms of cost, I mean, if people want to reach out and and contact me, we can we can go through it in more details. I don't want to share costs publicly like this, but suffice it to say, we've got clients who are using it via a license, all you can eat, who are testing visuals for less than five euros. Fantastic, fantastic. We've had such a wealth of information from you here today. We're coming very close to our time to wrap this up. Thank you, Giles, for your super question and all the other chat that's been going in chat. If you've got really driving questions that you want to put to Phil, please send them via an email to me. You have my yeah. details and I'll pass them on to Phil. Yeah, Can do I just ahead, answer though. a question, Tal Zilberman? I'd love you to. I didn't know yeah. you had time, so please no, no, do no. go ahead. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so Tal's question is, can you talk about framing in terms of eye tracking testing as the creative will be next to other elements and various environments? Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, the, the fact is you will never be able to replicate every permutation of reality, right? You don't know what your competitors are doing. You don't know what the lighting's like, what you're up against, etc. So what can you do? You can certainly test the the image in isolation to see when people look at the image, how will that get processed? The other thing you can do is you can give the machine different contexts. So you could say, yeah, let's put it on a poster in a street or let it put, let's put it on a, on a digital site just outside a store. Let's put it online, you know, on the left or the right, whatever it might be. So you can provide the environment and the machine will give you an idea of cut through within that environment. So it, it's a guide, it's to help you, but as I said, it will never replicate all the possibilities. Thank you so much, that's fantastic. And as you said, Bill, attention is number one. I kind of yeah. laughed when I saw you bring that up because coincidentally I was watching saying Gary Glenn Ross again last night. Alec Baldwin, are you paying attention? Yeah. So absolutely. When all said and done, everything that's been said today, yeah, attention is key. Yes, absolutely. You've got to get into the brain. It's yeah, you know, without that, nothing else gets processed. Absolutely. Arian's asked a question, how come in the brain scans we see more efforts with boredom or boring brands? So the the reason why there was more effort was because the brand that had been shown to the respondent was not their favourite. 
and, and they're a pair of brands and neither of them was the favorite. So they were then having to think, which of the brands will I buy? And it's just that reflection, that extra thinking effort when the favorite was not present. Thanks. Thanks for drawing attention to that, Marion. Will the slides be available? Will you be able to share that deck with me? I, to, yeah, uh, I, can, yeah. I can share a selection of them for sure. Super. That's super. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this whistle stop tour about the, the science behind price with Phil. Thank you very much for joining us today, Phil. Always a joy to speak to you to hear all about the work that you're doing. Thanks, everybody. And do join us again. We usually host these events once a month. Watch out towards the end of the month who we'll be speaking with in March. Thank and you Lu so much, Phil. And thanks, Louise. everybody. Sorry, Louise, just very quickly. And you can share my contact details with people. So if they want to follow up, feel free. Thank you. Thanks so much, Phil. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks, everyone, and for your attention. Have a good rest of the day. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.